I don't know if they have this expression wherever you're from. <coughs> in, in the U.S., we have a way of asking somebody how they're doing, which goes like this. So how's the world treating you? I had a, a day on Friday when I felt the world wasn't treating me like I ought to be treated. Did you ever have one of those days? Is the world giving you any trouble, stress, frustration? Let me turn the question just a little bit and ask you this. Who's the greatest source of frustration in your life? <laughs> you better not answer that question out loud, yeah. Is it maybe somebody close to you? That happens. They have the most opportunities to frustrate us if they're close to us. Well, I'd like to suggest this. The person most responsible for the frustrations in your life is you. Our tendency is to see our situation or the people around us as the source of our frustrations. And it's true, they often behave badly. But the Bible actually says, rejoice when the world troubles you in various ways. The Bible is so unreasonable sometimes. Rejoice when the world troubles you in various ways. There's an old gospel song <clears throat> with this line, take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently. When people are doing you wrong, you maybe you ought to notice how much you do people wrong is the actual theme of that song. <laughs> Though it has a second theme, which is better. We're usually quick to notice all the sin around us and not notice our own. we usually don't notice that we could have or should have adopted different expectations, for example. A lot of our frustration comes from the fact that we think about how things ought to be. And forget about how they actually are. Well, okay, suppose I shift from pointing the finger at you and point it at myself instead. How's that going to help? Last week, we started asking this question. What if it's true? <clears throat> if the gospel is true, what should I do? If the gospel's true, it changes everything for the one who believes in it, for the one who trusts in Christ. Let me say that again. If the gospel is true, it changes everything for the one who trusts in Christ, including your whole strategy for life. The whole thing is changed if the gospel's true and you believe it. Your whole approach to everything is changed. Your way of relating to people around you. Today's text is about the essence of the essence of that new approach. 
Perhaps it will surprise you to find out that new approach is not about self-improvement or moral reform. That new approach is not about just changing whether you're pointing the finger out or pointing it in. The key element, <coughs> the key element of the answer to this question, if the gospel is true, then is an issue of identity, not technique. That is a really important, really, really important distinction. The key element in the way the truth of the gospel changes everything for the believer, the key element in that is a question of identity, not technique. It's not about you tweaking some little thought or process or behavior. It's about who you are. If the gospel is true, you are new. Don't you love the way that rhymes? If the gospel is true, you are new. Here's another thing. The way you became new, the way you became new in Christ is also the way you live out your newness. We often think, I became new by trusting in Christ, and I live that out by some other set of techniques, some clever biblical principles for life, some moral reform, Some self-improvement turns out the way I live this life is the same as the way I got this life. That is exactly what Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 says in case anyone wants some proof. Colossians 2, 6, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How did you receive Christ is the same as how you walk in Christ. <clears throat> so, we want to look at Ephesians chapter 4 where we see the the very essence of this transformation described in Ephesians 4, starting in verse, well, I'm going to start in verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's most of what we talked about last Sunday. <coughs> but that is not the way you learned Christ. So what is the way you learned Christ? Okay, we'll get to this. That is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self or your old man, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self 
created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. <clears throat> so in this text, there are three things you've learned in Christ. These three things you learned to come to Christ. And these three things you learn to live in Christ, to walk in Christ as opposed to walking the old way, the unredeemed you way. You know, as unredeemed people living in an unredeemed world, we have a habit, a practice, a way that forms even how we think and uh, how, how we operate in our rational minds, what we see as wise, the old way. And now we are being invited to walk a new way. And we came to this the same way we continue in it. Now here the focus is on continuing in it. Three things we learned. First of all, to put off the old man. You learned to put off the old man. Who's the old man? You. You. So when I say, you know, your, your source frustrations is you, this is what I'm talking about. The old man is you, unredeemed you. And apparently, this is still hanging around because you need to put it off. <coughs> this is the you that lives according to the Gentiles, like we talked about a lot, the old way, the original way, the fallen way. And here he gives this additional description, the one being corrupted by deceitful desires. Do you have any deceitful desires? I dare say. You, like me, like all of us, you are capable of lying to yourself and falling for it. Happens all the time. So we are called upon to put off this original way. What is the essence of the old man? The old man is the do-it-yourself man. That is the essence of it. The essence of the flesh is the do-it-yourself man, the do-it-yourself version of you. And if you hear what's good, you say, I will do it myself. And if you hear what you want to do, even though it's bad, you say, I will do it myself. It's you in charge of you. It is you as God. It is you, the idol, the replacement, the thing that Adam fell for that led us all into this condition is independence, self-reliant, do-it-yourself. That's the very essence of the old man. That is the man who is corrupted by deceitful desires. I can handle this. This uh, carries on into the Christian life in exactly this way. If I tell you how to behave, the flesh immediately says, got it. I'll handle it. I'll behave. No problem. Uh, it's clear exactly what needs to be done. I'll do it. And the flesh does not notice because it's self-deceiving. The flesh does not notice that you doing it independently is just as unrighteous as you not doing it at all. If you do it apart from the loving fellowship and provision of God, then it's still unrighteous even though the act itself might be good. And so, the old do-it-yourself man put that off. 
And now you put this off, this says, to be renewed. To be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, we have a very strong tendency in the Christian world to want to separate our spirit from everything else. As though the spirit were, was the true me, the mystical force me. But this is the spirit of your mind. The truly spiritual you is the thinking you. Be renewed in your spirit, in the spirit of your mind, your reason, your wisdom, your rationale. You should notice there's a switch here from deceitful desire to spirit of your mind, from emotion, feeling, to direction, thinking. Decision making from wavery to solid, responsible to wise, to be renewed in your spirit of your mind, to move from desire to mind. The Christian life is not an unthinking life. It involves careful reason. That is because the main thing about it is something we call the truth. Truth with the capital T, which is personified in the man Jesus, the truth. So truth is not just about our logical processes. It involves the whole person but the whole mind involves the whole person. Your mind has a spirit. How about that? Mind is the thing renewed. This is repeated in Romans chapter 12, right? Be transformed. How? By the renewing of what? Your mind. Your mind. One of the things the Lord is doing in you that makes you new is he is recreating your mind. So that your mind is true and not deceived. So we put off the old man we, by, to the renewing of our mind. And then this is in order to put on the new man. The new man. So that's the basic essence of the whole thing. We say no to do it yourself. We open our mind to the truth of the gospel. If the gospel's true, it changes everything. And we put on the new man. Who is this new man that we're putting on? Now, you should already know that if you've been joining us for this whole passage through the book of Ephesians. Who's the new man? Well, here's something the new man is not. A fixed old man. That is not the new man. The, the, the new man is not the flesh re-rigged or corrected, or doing better. It is not do it yourself, only do it right, which is often what we're trying in the Christian life. We're still doing it ourselves, only we're just trying to do it right. And, well, you probably know how that works out. And if you don't know how that works out, just read Romans 7, which is all about how that works out. It doesn't. So the new man is not a reformed or improved old man. You don't need to be fixed. 
you need to be delivered. Here, the new man is described with this expression, created according to God. Another way of saying that is created in the likeness of God. Whose likeness is the old man in? Adam. Adam. The original do-it-yourselfer. And we are all born in do-it-yourself land. And now we have been born again into do-it-with-God land, which was the original plan in the first place, which is what it meant when God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness, in the likeness of God, created. Now here there's a, there's a distinction between created and corrupted. The old man is corrupted by deceitful desires. The new man is created in the likeness of God. Totally new. Like, the, Pat, like that famous verse says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, everything is made new. Created in the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness is the translation here, but this isn't the usual word for holiness. This is a word for devotion. Holiness is about, is about belonging, separated, called to God, holy in a, cat, in a whole other category. This is a word for being devoted. It's translated sometimes with the word piety. So this person, this new man is created according to the likeness of God in righteousness and devotion to God. Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness. And then there's an expression here at the very end of this text in the original language according to truth. According to truth. This is a, a distinction from the old man who is subject to deceitful desires. The new man is created in the image and likeness of God and true, true, in the truth the holiness, the righteousness, the devotion to God in the truth. In the truth. The John chapter 3 states this like this, born again. Born again. Now, here in the book of Ephesians, we have another layer on this subject. Who is the new man? The new man is us, not just me. The new man is us in Christ, us together in Christ. This goes back to chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, where we read that the church is his body, the fullness of him. And then in chapter 2, verse 10, we, plural, are his workmanship, singular. There's only one workmanship made up of we. We are his workmanship created in, there's our word, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, in the modern world, we want to individualize all of that. We say, I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. 
unto good works, which God prepared beforehand, that I should walk in them. That is not what the text says. It says we. And so who is the new man? Us created in Christ. In chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, this is made utterly explicit when it says that Christ, when he died for us, he did so that he might create in himself one new man from two nations, two peoples, the people of Israel and the Gentiles. And so from the two massive groups, he made what? One. One new man. Not millions of new men. Though that also is true. But it's not what this text is about. This text says he made us one new man in him and reconciled us together in one body to God. So when we were reconciled to God by the work of the cross, it was as a group, as a one thing, not as each of us. Okay, each of us too, but in this text, the emphasis is on the one thing, which we are in him, one new man. So here in the book of Ephesians, the new man is us together in Christ. <clears throat> and we are being built at the end of chapter 2. We are being built into a dwelling place of God. We individualize this, don't we? I say, I am a dwelling place of God, and you are a dwelling place of God, and each of us is a dwelling place of God. And God has to move every couple of seconds, I guess, but each of us is a dwelling place of God. But here, no, the church is one dwelling place of God. The group In chapter 3, Paul prayed that Christ would dwell in your hearts, plural, through faith to comprehend together. So Christ dwells in my heart through faith and he dwells in your heart through faith so that together we might maybe begin to understand the incomprehensible love of Christ and to be filled with with all the fullness of God, the truth. And Christ dwells in our hearts through how? Faith, trust, so that we can comprehend together with all the saints the incomprehensible love of Christ and to be filled with all the fullness of God, the truth. In chapter 4, we just read that passage, a famous passage where each, where the certain people equip the saints for works of service for the building up of the body of Christ. You remember that, right? Until we all come to a mature man. It does not say until we each become a mature man. It says until we all together Make one mature man. It's not about a bunch of mature men. It's about one. And that one is the body of Christ. The communion of the saints. That thing that we are then called upon in chapter 4 to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Who is this new man? Christ in us. Us in Christ. I do not recommend you trying to be, well, transformed in this way, putting off, being renewed, putting on by yourself. In fact, I guess I would say based on this text, that's not even possible. 
We absolutely all the time are not thinking enough about how much we need one another. And there I'm only talking about what I need. I'm not even yet talking about what you need from me. And what the us needs from each. Where each part does its part for the building up of the body. What's the important thing there? The building up of the body. Not just the building up of the individual Christian. So to put on Christ, can you put on Christ if you don't put on the church? Not so much. So here's the bottom line. Put off unredeemed you. Do it yourself, you. Put on Christ along with the rest of us. This is about who you are now. Who you are is a member of the body of Christ. Who you are is born again in Christ, justified, reconciled, free from judgment. That's who you are. So when you catch yourself in your old man ways, which you will do from time to time, and it will happen before you, you didn't decide you didn't sit there one morning and say, today I'm going to behave as the old man. That, I think, almost never happens. You find yourself over there. And when you find yourself walking in the way of the Gentiles, in the fallen way, in the do-it-yourself way, what should you do? Should you say, well, I'm going to work to do better? Well, that's staying there. No. What you need to do is focus. What you need to do when you catch yourself in your old man ways is remember you trust Christ. Not yourself. That's the basic gap. That's the whole idea. You remember, you trust Christ, not yourself. You look to Him, not yourself. You are making a responsible choice when you do that. I mean, you can't eliminate yourself from this equation. You want to focus or redirect your attention. Your attention should be redirected so that you are focusing on Christ and what He has done and on your identity in Christ. But one of the things He has done is has made you new. So you are focused on Him, what He has done, and your identity in Christ. You are justified you are reconciled. You are pleasing to God in Christ. Already. You are pleasing to God. Period. In Christ. You are born again by the Spirit. You are a whole new person. So you focus your attention on Christ. Then... Abandon trust in yourself and in your own works. Adopt trust in Christ and His work. This is about simple faith. It's about who you trust. Here's something you should notice. 
who you are, who you are, is always wrapped up in who you trust. Who you are is who you trust. It's about simple faith. This is the heart of all real repentance. If you have noticed yourself doing badly and you want to turn from doing badly to doing well, the very heart of all biblical repentance is a question of who you trust. It is turning from sin. The very nature of sin is do it yourself. I will trust myself to get whatever needs done, done. It is turning from trusting yourself to trusting Christ. What He has done that has liberated you, that has made you spiritually alive again in Him. I don't repent by determining more solidly not to sin anymore. That's what people usually mean when they use the word repent. That is not a biblical repentance. Biblical repentance is about who do you trust, not what will you do. The change of heart, soul, and mind that leads to a changed work is a change of trust. And remember, we do this together. We do this together. Here's something I noticed on Friday when I was having this day when, you know, the world was not treating me the way it's supposed to. And I was getting angry and frustrated. Here's what I noticed. I needed someone else to interrupt my do-it-yourself ways. I was not going to interrupt my do-it-myself ways by myself. I was enjoying my do-it, my anger. I was feeling righteous because anger is always grounded in a feeling of righteous. This isn't right, what they're doing. And I am right. You know, the Scripture says the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Hmm. What does produce the righteousness of God? The Lord Jesus Christ and His sacrifice for my unrighteousness that in which I receive the full credit of His perfectly righteous life before God, I receive that freely without any change in my outward behavior required. I just get it because I say, okay. That is how the righteousness of God is produced. When I trust in Christ and I put off the old man, the do-it-yourself man, and I say, let us go together in the love of Christ. Let us go together in the love of Christ. Then we will see a transformation in our walk. We do this together, engaged in real fellowship in the church to speak the truth in love. Someone did interrupt me on Friday. Someone came in my office and just distracted me from my righteous indignation. Thank you. And I was able to stop and focus myself again and say, I trust Christ. Most of the time, you need someone to tell you that. Most of the time, 
we get caught up in ourselves and we have a hard time breaking out of the old way on our own. So we come to church every Sunday and we hear the great news of God's amazing grace. And we go, oh, right, that's right, that's right. That's true. And because it's true, I am new. I am not the same old guy. And when I act like the same old guy, I'm messing up my true identity in Christ. So what do I do? I say, no, focus on the truth, put on Christ. And when I put on Christ, I put on you too. And we walk together in the grace of God. That's the very essence <laughs> of the new man, of the new life, the change we're looking for. It's a struggle. I, you, you can't deny it. We sort of default. If I don't keep my focus, if you don't help me keep my focus, I'm going to end up over there by Friday. And we need each other for this. Let us serve one another in this. Father, we give you thanks that you are not leaving us alone, <laughs> isolated, alienated, to try to figure it out for ourselves. But you have restored fellowship in our lives, fellowship with you, fellowship with each other, fellowship in the truth of your grace, your goodness, your generosity, your love, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus that satisfies your wrath for my sin, for everyone's sin, so that we are free, so that we are made new. Lord, please help us to walk in this new way. We need you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.